Now that we've spent a few weeks developing our Verilog skills for design and simulation, it's time to start implementing our circuits in hardware. For the rest of the semester, we'll be working on designs and implementing them on an FPGA device. We're using this, the D10 Lite board, which is an evaluation kit for an Altera Max 10 FPGA device. The FPGA is just a single chip in the middle of the board. Everything else here is to support and interact with it, so let's take a closer look at what we've got. This big chip in the middle here is our Max 10 FPGA. It's in a BGA or Ball Grid Array package, so all 484 of the pins are located underneath. These pins are connected to different components and devices on the board, ready to be hooked up to our circuits. We've got some dedicated I.O. on board, with switches and buttons for input and LEDs and 7-segment displays for output. In terms of GPIO, we've got this big 2x20 pin header along the top, which is a standard type of header for FPGA development kits, and also two single row headers laid out in the standard Arduino format. This means we can easily connect Arduino shields to this board to extend functionality without having to design any sort of custom solution. The FPGA chip is by no means the only IC on board. We've got some supporting chips as well, including a big 64MB SD RAM chip, a clock generator, a 3-axis accelerometer, and some op-amps to buffer the ADC input. Interestingly, this big chip up on the top left is a CPLD. It's used exclusively to deal with the programming of the FPGA, so it takes the data from the USB connection and generates programming signals to write the netlist to the FPGA device. It being a CPLD means that if we wanted to, we could program this too, effectively reprogramming the device which programs our device. So let's have a quick look at the basic block diagram for the board, where we can see our inputs and outputs connecting to the FPGA chip. The only major things to note here are that our ADC is actually part of the MAX-10 chip. We don't need any external ADCs, just a bit of buffering to regulate the signal. And that we have some baked-in debouncing circuitry for the buttons. As we're going to be running this device at very high speeds, any short flickers on the button inputs could have serious repercussions on the input detected in our designs. One very important thing to know with regards to this board is how to properly handle it. FPGAs use a very low current and are extremely sensitive to static discharge. Just from walking around, we can easily build up many kilovolts in potential and making a bridge between components with the skin will discharge this voltage across them. As the charge dissipates quickly, the amount of energy transferred is fairly low, too low to damage you anyway, but it can still be several amps at its peak and therefore runs a high risk of blowing up the sensitive components on board. Now to avoid this, you should take multiple steps. Firstly, the front of our boards has a perspex screen so we can't easily touch the components. The back does not. Therefore, you should only ever hold the board by its edges. Dragging a finger or your palm across the components on the back is just asking to blow something up. Secondly, store your boards in the accompanying anti-static bags when you're not using them. This allows you to carry them around without having to worry about charge building up in other materials that they might be near. Finally, only work with the board on anti-static mats. These are standard on all desks in Lab 160. If you want to work with the board at home, you can buy a mat from Amazon for about a tenner and ground it through a radiator. Remember, boards do not randomly blow up. Your board is your responsibility, therefore you need to take responsibility for blowing your board up should it happen. Connecting the board to a PC is very simple. You just need to connect via USB to the big USB Type-B port on the board. On the lab machines, all of the drivers are already installed, so it should work out of the box. If you're installing on your laptop, you'll need to install the USB blaster drivers. I'm not going to give you a step-by-step -step guide on how to do this, because A, if you're a vaguely competent computer user, you should already know how to do it, and B, if I do give you a step-by-step -step guide, people will inevitably ignore my warning of don't do this on the lab machines and attempt to install drivers on the lab machines. The driver files are located in the quarters installation folder under drivers USB blaster, so follow the standard driver install procedure and get them from there. If the drivers are installed correctly, you should be able to see the USB blaster in the device manager when you plug the board in. One final thing to take a look at is the board's user manual. 
The user manual contains a huge amount of information about the board and you need to use it as a guide for the rest of the semester. It contains things like schematics, timing information and programming instructions, but there's one particular thing that you'll need to become very familiar with. It contains detailed information about the peripherals and devices on board and how they connect to the FPGA. For the rest of the semester, we're going to be interacting with the I.O. on board, and therefore we need to know exactly which pins of the FPGA everything is wired to. Luckily, this user manual was full of tables showing just that. So when we start connecting our designs to the outside world, you'll be expected to use this guide as a reference and look it up for yourselves. I won't be telling you which pin each and every switch and LED are connected to when it's all laid out for you in an easy-to-read format here. So that's just about everything for an overview. We've had a good look at our board and its features, so it's now time to actually start implementing our designs on the chip.